You are listening to As a Woman, Episode 30, Ovarian Reserve. In this episode, I am talking all about ovarian reserve, what it is, what it means, when you should get it checked, and how to view this assessment of your ovarian potential, information on diminished ovarian reserve, and what that means for your long-term fertility. Welcome to As a Woman, the podcast hosted by fertility physician, Dr. Natalie Crawford, to educate and empower women. Each week, learn about your health, your fertility, and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community, fostering collaboration over competition, while learning how to authentically find your voice and amplify others as a woman. Hi, friends. Welcome back to As a Woman. You are listening to episode 30 Can you believe we've had 30 episodes? This is Ovarian Reserve. The reason why I'm dedicating an entire episode to Ovarian Reserve is simply this. There are so many questions, there's a lot in the media, and there's a lot of mistakes that women are making. I don't have all the answers, but I think that it's important that we view our fertility as something that's dynamic and changing and really understanding that no test will predict future fertility. So because of that, I'm taking this episode a little more in depth than just the age and fertility episode about ovarian reserve, and I'm spending a substantial time talking about diminished ovarian reserve. What does that mean for you if you get that diagnosis? Probably half the patients I see every day have DOR or diminished ovarian reserve. It is a really hard diagnosis. If this is you, girl, I'm with you. It's a hard place to be. My heart goes out to you because you are suddenly being pressed to make decisions really quickly, and it's overwhelming to view that your family may not look like what you wanted it to. Now listen right here. No test can I do, can any company do, that will tell you how many eggs you have left. The idea that testing your fertility is going to determine how long you have to conceive is fake. It is false. It's not true. And I'm saying that right up here at minute number two into this episode because I think it is so important for you to understand that you can't go get your fertility checked and say, okay, well, I'm average for my age, so I'm all good, and presume that you'll always be average. All we can tell you is that you're good right now. All we can tell you is you're not good right now. So, It's very important that if you want to check your fertility, which you guys know I'm a huge fan of, totally believe that if you want kids in the future, you need to be making proactive steps. But listen, if you go and check an AMH value, whether it's with me, your OBGYN, a different company that's promoting an event with free AMH testing, a mail order kit, whatever it is, the whole purpose of doing it is to make sure that you're not low right now. Because if you're low, you can go and act. If you're doing it because you want to have kids in the future, that test is not telling you about the future. And you really need to consider, should you be acting on it anyway? And by acting, I mean freezing your eggs or preserving your fertility based on your plan. I see women every single day who had an AMH checked by somebody, and it was normal. And they view that as confirmation that they themselves are normal and can wait. And they purposefully then, because of that test, delay getting pregnant. And what that does is it sets them up for failure. Because remember, we are only checking one point of a line. We don't know the slope of the line. I don't know your rate of decline, but everybody's declining. And so to think that, well, because this is normal, my rate of decline must be normal. That's not smart. And I've seen women, I have patients, who have a normal value one year. The next year, it's just fallen off a cliff and it is not there anymore. So that's important to understand that that can happen to you. And I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to make you understand what these tests are, what we're checking for. As testing and talking about fertility is becoming more common, great, huge fan of that but you need to understand what are we checking. Let's start by diving into ovarian reserve. If you've ever listened to this podcast, if you've ever seen me in clinic, you know my favorite analogy. So here it goes. 
inside your ovary, imagine you're born with all the eggs you're ever going to have trapped in a vault. I can't see in the vault. I have no idea how many eggs are in the vault. No blood test can tell us what's in the vault. No ultrasound, nothing. I do not know how many eggs you have left. I don't know when you'll be out of them. I don't know. I'm asked that every day when we talk about these tests. I wish I had the magic ball and could tell you. I can only tell you tests that are representations of what's in the vault. So surrogate markers of the vault. What that means is that from the vault, at the start of every month, a group of eggs are released. Each egg grows inside a follicle. Now, in general, the vault keeper is very liberal when you have a lot of eggs. So you have a lot of eggs inside the vault, and she lets more eggs out every month. And when you have fewer eggs, she lets fewer eggs out every month. We can only evaluate the eggs outside the vault. That's point number one. So when we do an ultrasound, we can count an antral follicle count. That's counting the small eggs that have been released from the vault that month. We can get an idea, is that below average, average, or above average for your age? So that's an assessment we just do with ultrasound. I do this at almost every new patient I visit, get an idea of what we're seeing. The other most common test is an AMH. So if you're getting your blood check to check your fertility hormone or how many eggs you have left, I'm putting it in quotes even though you can't see me, what people are checking is AMH, and that's anti-mullerian hormone. AMH is made from the cells that surround each of these eggs that have been released from the vault. So very similarly, or exactly the same, it is a marker of the eggs that are outside the vault. So it is not telling us how many eggs are in the vault. It is not telling us any of that. It is just categorizing you low, above average, average, whatever. Now, importantly, the vault keeper is not perfect. So just because you have fewer eggs, she'll usually let fewer out. There can be 30% variation month to month. So that number can fluctuate. I always tell patients, hey, if you went to every fertility clinic in town and you had an AMH checked every month, it would drive you batty. You would see your value go up and down and up and down and up and down, and that would drive you nuts. So really, I don't want you fixating on the number or on the decimal point. It's the category that matters above average, average, below average, or even critically low. When we take out the exception of critically low, so you can be low average or high, that doesn't impact your chance of getting pregnant per month as long as you're still ovulating. What happens is all these eggs are outside the vault. The brain sends out follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, my most favorite hormone. It stimulates a follicle to grow, so it is well-named. As the follicle grows, the egg matures, it makes estrogen. Every other egg then dies. That one ovulates, the others die. It does not matter. You only have three eggs and you have an AMH of 0.2. Hey, one of them's going to ovulate, the other two are going to die. You have 42 eggs and your AMH is 7.3. It doesn't matter. One of them's going to ovulate, the rest of them are going to die. Now, at the extremes of ovarian reserve, we do see hormonal dysfunction, which is represented by abnormal period findings. So a very low ovarian reserve means that sometimes you're starting to get hormonal dysfunction. It's taking a lot of FSH to get that one egg to grow. Sometimes you're ovulating very early, maybe getting a luteal phase defect. You do see hormonal changes, but you notice this because your period is changing. At the other extreme, at very high ovarian reserves, that often means a lot of eggs are being released from the vault. And this could cause or be part of a syndrome called PCOS. You can learn more about that in the PCOS episode, but in theory, those patients often don't ovulate either because the FSH signal gets dispersed too thinly between all of these follicles. But if you're ovulating and you're having a period every month, your chance of getting pregnant per month is the exact same. It is your age-related chance, regardless of if you have low or normal or high ovarian reserve. So when I see women They'll say, oh, I have this low ovarian reserve, so that's why I'm not getting pregnant. Nope. We evaluate ovarian reserve because it aids in counseling. It is very helpful for you in planning your whole family. But a low AMH test, a low antral follicle count, is not a cause of infertility. It is an important part of the evaluation, but it is not a cause. 
And that blows most people's mind. There was a great study by my fellowship mentor, Ann Steiner. She's huge in our field. So she was my mentor at UNC and she's now division director at Duke. And I did all of my fellowship research in a cohort study she had at UNC called Time to Conceive. Time to Conceive was a really interesting project. It was a cohort. She had an NIH grant, had almost a thousand women age 30 and above who were trying to get pregnant without any known infertility. A bunch of blood work checked. They monitored their cycles. We got a lot of cycle characteristics from them. We were able to take that data and look at natural fertility or the chance of getting pregnant per month, which we call fecundability, in these women who are not undergoing infertility treatments, not diagnosed as being infertile. And in that really great big study, a low AMH value was not correlated with a decreased chance of getting pregnant per month. That actually blew everybody's mind because her prelim study with only 100 people that got the grant showed a difference. So the big study, the 1,000 people, was published in JAMA. That's a huge journal for those of you who don't know. The smaller one was published in the Green Journal, still an amazing journal in our field. But we had a small study that showed a difference, that women with low AMH had a decreased chance of getting pregnant. So she got funding and did a bigger study, and the bigger study actually showed no difference. This is also a great representation that, one, You can find whatever you want if you're trying to in medical literature. If you're trying to prove to me that a low AMH is associated with a decreased fecundability, you could Google or PubMed that and find Anne's first study and come and show it to me. And if I didn't know any better, I'd be like, oh my gosh, there's an article right there talking about a low AMH and decreased fecundability published by a respected leader of our field in a very well-known journal. But it has a low N and it had a follow up. And so you have to be very critical if you are a lay person evaluating the literature. Our job as physicians, especially fertility physicians, is to take all the evidence that's out there and translate it into something that is meaningful to you. And so our take home is that AMH is important, and I'm going to go into why, but it is not associated with a decreased chance of getting pregnant naturally. So if you go and get your AMH screened and you're trying to get pregnant and you've been trying for one month and your AMH is low, that doesn't mean you can't get pregnant. So I don't want that to be the idea because so many women feel that way. And as I already said, AMH is not a perfect test. It fluctuates month to month, but over time it is going to drop. Every woman's going to run out of eggs. You will start to release fewer from your vault. Your AMH will decrease. And there are some other factors that can cause your AMH to be suppressed. The most common is birth control pills. So every day I get messages from young women. Should I be checking my AMH? I've been on the pill for three years. Should I check it? It may be low. I don't have women go off the pill to check AMH. And probably most fertility physicians feel the same way. I will still check it. Knowing that the pill may cause it to be a little lower than reality, that's okay. I'd rather presume your AMH is lower than it did because then we're being very conservative. It's not substantially lowering it, but it may be statistically lower if you've been taking the birth control pill. And that effect appears to wear off if you've been off the pill for a few months. So sometimes I really do stop the pill and recheck it, but often I don't because by the time patients see me, they're in a different mindset. They're at my office because they want to do something about their fertility. But here's my number one concern, and this is why I love when women do get their hormones checked. I like a screening AMH value because you give the woman with the low ovarian reserve or the DOR the chance to do something different. I'll use myself as an example. I was married at age 24. I was in med school. I was not anywhere ready to be a mom. But if I had had a blood test that told me it was now or never, I could have tried to get pregnant, changed my life goals, but we could have done it. We were married. We had support. I could have frozen eggs or embryos. We could have gone through action steps to have the family we wanted if I wasn't really ready at that time. I didn't check my AMH. That wasn't a thing we did back then. So I would have had no idea. 
But if I'd gotten it checked and it had been lower, at least the decision would have been mine. And that's why I do feel like testing for your ovarian reserve is very empowering as long as you understand what it's really testing. It is actually the opposite of empowering if you take this information and correlate it wrong. If you have a normal value, so you say, great, I'm going to wait five years because I'm in med school and your slope is very steep and you have almost no ovarian reserve five years from now, your chance of having a multi-child family is now very low. So a normal test is telling you that right now things are normal. Right now you are average. Great. It is not telling us the rate of decline, not telling us the slope of the line, tells me nothing about next year. And similarly, a low test right now, you are not going to enter into normal. I don't know your rate of decline either. Maybe it is a different slope and it's not quite as steep. So you're going to stay in the same place for a long time. But I don't know. What if it is steep? So we have to make family planning decisions very conservatively, anticipating that the slope of your line is steep because I don't know the truth there. So the woman sitting in my office who is 35 and has no kids and has a very low AMH, I have to say, I don't know the rate of this decline. You may be in a position where you do not get to have multiple children from your natural ovarian reserve, which means maybe you can get pregnant right now. But after you're pregnant, give birth, heal, and you're ready to get pregnant again, I don't know what you'll be left with especially when you combine genetic changes that we all know happen as we get older. So this is the reality for a woman who has a low AMH at any time point, is that I don't know if you have left inside your vault, because I can't see in there, what you will need to achieve the family of your dreams. And very often, women with a low ovarian reserve are going through measures to preserve their fertility. They're freezing eggs if they're single. They're going through IVF and freezing embryos if they are married or partnered with somebody they want to have children with. And sometimes those are baby number two. Sometimes those embryos are frozen to be baby two or three later down the road. Maybe they're not frozen for right now. Some couples will still try to get pregnant naturally. It depends on so many different factors. But the truth is, if you want multiple children and you have a low AMH, the time to act is now. Here's the really hard thing. A low AMH means you have less eggs released from the vault. And when we do IVF or egg freezing, that's the denominator. That is how many eggs we can get, whatever's outside the vault. I can't tap into the vault with IVF. So you may have to do multiple cycles to make up for your low AMH. So you may need to go through more rounds of egg freezing or IVF to get a high enough number to be what you need to actually preserve your fertility. That is why if you are purposely delaying your family and you have a normal AMH, girl, you're a good candidate to go through something right now because you're going to get a lot of eggs. Your return on that investment is going to be higher because you're not going to have to invest as much. If you wait until your AMH is low to go freeze your eggs, you will spend more money because you will need more cycles to get the same outcome. And if time has passed, Your egg quality is going to be different. So one huge other thing that I always hear is I was waiting to freeze my eggs because my AMH was normal. Ugh, stab me in the heart. If your AMH is normal and you are thinking about freezing your eggs because you are delaying childbearing, you need to do it now because it'll be easier. You'll get to a higher number faster. It won't be as heartbreaking to you to be one of those women with a low AMH who is trying to build her family through this amazing technology, but struggling. I also really, really hate when women with a low AMH are told they can't do IVF. I feel like it's very paternalistic. I think the beauty is in the counseling. You have to set someone's expectations appropriately. If you're not going to get many eggs, and if you listen to the IVF or the egg freezing episode, you know that not every egg turns into a baby. So if you're not going to get a lot of eggs, you need to do multiple rounds. That's going to cost more money or take more time. It is okay. You can use the time. You can find the money. If that's your number one goal or a big goal for you, you can do it. But you need to know what to expect. 
with a low AMH, with a low antral follicle count, I'm going to get fewer eggs from you. I'm going to require higher doses of medication for your cycle. You may need to go through more cycles. You're going to have a higher cycle cancellation rate because the difference in two eggs and six eggs is significant. So you have to really know that that journey is going to be harder if you wait until you have a low AMH to act. So these tests of ovarian reserve, antral follicle count, AMH, and then day three testing, which includes FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, my favorite, and estradiol, those tests are to give us an idea of how many eggs you have. That's what AFC and the AMH are telling us, how many are outside the vault. And the FSH and estrogen are telling us how the brain and ovary are communicating. Now, these tests, again, they are not at all talking about quality of your eggs. So this is a quantity-only question that we are talking about with ovarian reserve. I do have women come and say, oh, I have poor egg quality because my AMH is really low. That's not true. Quality is associated with your age, number one. And then also it looks like some lifestyle factors are impacting quality. Now, it gets messy because lifestyle factors can also impact your ovarian reserve. So some of the things that we treat poor egg quality with may also help with ovarian reserve. So there's overlap. But just because you have a low AMH doesn't mean that you have poor egg quality, but it certainly means you should improve your egg quality the best that you can. This is the time. This is the time to listen to that environmental toxins episode and clean up your life. This is the time that you go plant-based and you're eliminating meats and sugars and other dietary toxins. This is the time that you start taking supplements, that you are taking the nutrients that your body needs to give your eggs all the supplements and energy that they need to function the best that they can because there's fewer of them. So that's what I do. Low ovarian reserve or if you're older. So because you're older, I know your egg quality is going to be poor. And if you have low ovarian reserve, you've got no room for error. Those patients are on a prenatal vitamin. I am making sure they are taking an extra high dose of vitamin D. So usually at least 2,000 international units a day of D3. We are taking coenzyme Q10. So that's ubiquinol. My patients are taking 200 milligrams of that twice a day. And we're taking DHEA 25 milligrams a day. That is my supplement policy for most women who are falling into that category. Not everybody. I personalize it for each woman. But overall, those are my egg quality supplements. Now, I also am going to recommend you clean up your life. So the toxins, the plastics, the Teflon, all of that, I don't have time for that anymore. That's gone. The diet stuff, meat needs to be reduced or eliminated if it's possible. We're dropping out the processed foods, all of those places where environmental toxins, contaminants, extra hormones are getting into our body, we're done with it. We're dropping our inflammation down. We're giving our body the nutrients it needs. That's what we're doing for diminished ovarian reserve. And I'm looking at my patients. So if you're one of my patients and you come to me, you know this. I'm going to say, what is your goal? How many kids do you want? And I'm going to tell it to you really hard. I hope you don't dislike me that if you get pregnant right now with your low AMH, I will be so happy for you. But you may not have another baby in two years. I don't know. So if that other baby's important to you, meaning if you grew up in a sibling family and you want to have siblings, you don't just want one child, but those relationships are important to your family vision, we need to do something about it. And doing something means get something in the freezer, getting something in the freezer for later, because I don't know what later looks like and I'm worried. This is why we save for retirement, right? So totally different idea, but we are saving for retirement. Because we know we're not going to have the same ability to make money later. We're going to stop working at some time. So we're going to put money in the bank so we can access it when we don't have our job later. We're going to put eggs or embryos in the bank so we can access them when we don't have the eggs in our vault later. This is planning for your future. Or you change your plan, which is also okay. You may say, you know what? I'm not going to do these things. And I'm just going to see how my ovarian reserve is when I'm ready to have kids. 
understanding that I may not have the family I want the way I originally planned. Maybe they're not my genetic kids. Maybe I use an egg donor. That's okay too, guys. If you run out of eggs early, you can use an egg donor. It's an egg plus partner sperm. You carry the baby. You can still give birth if you run out of eggs. Your uterus will still work. That's all fine. So if that's you and you're open to that option, then this isn't quite as big of a deal to you. Or it shouldn't be. If you are okay using an egg donor later, which we also need to work on dropping that stigma down, then you don't need to go through these actions to preserve your fertility. But if having a genetic child, a genetic family is important to you, then you really need to think about it. What is your goal? Does the current support that that goal is possible? And remember, just because the current is good doesn't mean that that goal is possible. It just means we haven't ruled it out. But certainly, if your current situation is already in a spot that we are running low on eggs, we have to make decisions acting like our decline is very steep. That way we are best prepared for our future. So here are my takeaways. One, there are things you can do to improve your ovarian reserve. Largely, they include eating better and avoiding toxins, taking a multivitamin. You can do those things no matter what your ovarian reserve is. That's going to at least improve the quality of the eggs and not predispose them to running out in a faster fashion. Now, a lot of things about the rate of decline are things we don't know. Genetic, if your mom ran out of eggs early, you're more likely to also. We're also concerned about this with chronic surgery on the ovaries, like lots of cysts that have been removed. If you've lost an ovary in the past, if you have an inflammatory condition like endometriosis, if you have autoimmune disease like hypothyroidism, gluten sensitivity, irritable bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, we are worried about some of those autoimmune or inflammatory conditions. We don't know what that's doing to the ovary, but we certainly are highly suspicious that you may be at risk to run out of eggs earlier. You're born with a set number of eggs and everybody's is different. It may be that your pool is just smaller. It also may be that the greatest time of insult was actually when your mom was pregnant with you, when it had nothing to do with any decision or choice that you've made in your life. We know clearly that certain toxins, smoking is a great example, decrease ovarian reserve. You start to run out of eggs faster if you are smoking. That's one of the most preventable things you can do. And very often we don't know the answer. I don't know if this is the genetic number you're born with, some predisposition, fragile X syndrome, endometriosis, inflammatory conditions, autoimmune disease, or what? I don't have the good answer. All I can say is put yourself in the best position, arm yourself with knowledge, eat a clean diet, avoid toxins, take care of yourself. But as for that, if you want kids in the future, understand what testing your ovarian reserve means. If you are purposefully delaying childbearing past age 32 to 33 to start your family, Especially if you want more than one child, you should consider getting your ovarian reserve checked. You should also consider freezing your eggs or your embryos to preserve that fertility later while you get a good return on the investment. You should understand that if you have a low ovarian reserve, you can still get pregnant. You certainly need immediate fertility evaluation because we don't have time to wait 6, 12 months to find out tubes are blocked or sperm is low. We need all the data right away so you can make a good decision. You need to think about how old you are right now, how many kids you have. What is the reality about having future children if that's important to you later on down the road? But a low AMH does not correlate with a decreased chance of getting pregnant per month as long as nothing else is wrong. You have your same age-related chance. Testing for ovarian reserve if it's normal is not guaranteeing future fertility. I think people get that because they say, oh, yeah, yeah, fertility is so multidimensional and complex, and so obviously one test is not guaranteeing it. But one normal test of ovarian reserve is not guaranteeing that you are having a normal rate of decline of your ovarian reserve. We use odds and averages to guide us and give us examples, help us make the most educated decisions that we can, but your rate of decline is your rate of decline. I don't know what it is. So you have to know that if you're getting these tests done, do not 
wait on purpose because the test came back normal. That is not the point of the test. And testing ovarian reserve appears trendy. And I always like to comment on things that appear trendy because it makes women skeptical. The truth is, it's not trendy. It is just becoming more available. We didn't check AMH 10 years ago. We didn't have a good assay for it. And now we can. We weren't freezing eggs. It was experimental until 2012. Now freezing process is better and more eggs survive so we can offer that. So these tests are becoming trendy as we are able to offer them to people and as we as women are doing a better job at talking about our fertility, breaking down the stigma, trying to understand our own bodies, and empowering each other to get education about how the female body works and about our own reproductive system and our own body. Lastly, remember that statistics are there to guide us, as I already said. For any given woman, her chance of success, whatever she is defining her goal as, is zero or 100%. You're always going to have outliers. The woman who couldn't get pregnant despite everything being fine, the woman who got pregnant despite the doctor telling her it was highly unlikely. Don't listen to all those women in the periphery and let their stories guide yours. You get an evaluation yourself if this is something important to you. You get a doctor like me to talk to you about this. See a fertility specialist. I am always asked, should I do this blood testing from the internet because it's cheaper than seeing a fertility doctor? Actually false for most women. If you have commercial insurance, almost all of them will cover fertility testing and initial diagnostics. So coming to see me having an appointment, doing these tests, that's just subject to your normal copay, whatever your deductible is. So that's not like it's often thousands of dollars. If you're paying for all of it out of pocket, it can be more expensive. And then you need to know what your local clinic is charging for things. We're very transparent. So if you call, I don't have insurance. What does a consult cost? What's an ultrasound? What's an AMH test? We can tell you we are not in this to drive money out of you. I am not sucking money out of patients by checking AMHs and doing ultrasounds. I am trying to empower women with education about their own body so they can make the decisions that are best for them for their future. And that is what ovarian reserve testing is all about. Okay, friends, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for listening to me today. This is a little bit of a soapbox issue for me because I feel like so many women come in and they've just been led astray from a lot of different reasons meaning they had a normal test and they delayed getting pregnant and now they're in a worse position. They had a low test and they saw somebody who paternalistically told them IVF was not an option for them when that's what they need. So you need to empower yourself. I'm always a fan of advocating for yourself, making sure you understand why we do the things we do. And I appreciate you listening and hopefully this has helped and please share. I want to say a huge thanks to all of you for your support for this podcast. I can't believe the As a Woman podcast is now on episode 30, and it really brings me so much joy recording here in my closet, but really sharing it with you and seeing how you ask questions, respond. You come see me as patients, and you've listened to episodes, and it blows my mind to watch you nodding your head in understanding from visit number one. So thank you all for helping support share, promote, rate, review as a woman. I love it. Feel free to follow me along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Check out the blog, nataliecrawfordmd.com and join in next week. Thank you. Thank you.